Okay, hello and welcome to the Mathematics for Public Health Colloquium. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the land uh, on which this meeting is taking place. Um, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the Fields Institute operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity, opportunity to work on this land. I'm now going to hand you over to one of our principal investigators, Professor Jan Hong Wu, who will introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, uh, good day to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this uh, session of the Fields uh, Symposium. And I'm very glad today we have uh, Amy Herford coming back to Ontario, and uh, Amy uh, spent her PhD at Queen's University and um, worked with um, uh, uh, Andrew Morris and others uh, uh, on uh, uh, his uh, transition postdoc fellowship to uh, be in faculty at uh, University of Memorial at uh, Newfoundland and Nabado. And uh, Amy now is uh, a associate professor. And uh, I, I would like to characterize Amy as uh, 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 well, it's one with multiple homes. So uh, um, she is uh, a faculty member of both Department of Mathematics and Biology and cross pointed to the Faculty of Medicine. And uh, she is a member of our uh, Mathematical Public Health uh, NCP uh, um, uh, initiative network, but she is also a member of the other two uh, uh, sisters uh, networks as well and uh, her expertise has been widely consulted by both her um, provincial uh, and also the federal uh, agencies so she is a member of the public health uh, external uh, panels of expertise and um, uh, a member of the Canadian Immunity Task Force with all of this so we are really uh, with a frontline monitor today, uh, Amy, so it's your time. Thanks, Jin Hong. Just gonna try and share my screen here. Yeah, so I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, I can't really see anything in the chat. So uh, if there is a need to interrupt at any point because things aren't showing up very well, um, please let me know. So if not, I'm just gonna assume that uh, this is all showing up good for everybody. So thanks so much for having me. Uh, I, I guess I am a person of multiple homes. I really value at Memorial uh, the ability to work cross-disciplinary um, as a mathematical biologist, really appreciate that. And throughout the pandemic, it's been really helpful for me to be able to reach out to people in other jurisdictions. I think we're a lot of times answering similar questions, making important recommendations. And I'm always really wary of whether what I'm saying is, is um, in agreement with how other people are viewing the situation. And so, especially during the pandemic, I've reached out to a lot of the mathematical modeling, mathematical biology community throughout Canada and really appreciate everyone who's responded to my emails with questions at certain times. And certainly thanks also to the uh, Emerging Infectious Disease Networks, which have provided uh, funding for, for some of the work and to, just to help um, Newfoundland and Labrador be part of the national conversation on modeling COVID-19. So uh, I'm, I'm in Newfoundland and Labrador, and this has been my focus for most of the pandemic has been modeling for Newfoundland and Labrador. I consider it to be a smaller jurisdiction and some of these smaller jurisdictions in Canada have experienced qualitatively different COVID-19 outbreaks, at least up until May 30th, which is uh, what this figure is showing. So this figure is by Dr. Zara Mohammadi. She is a Mathematics for Public Health Next Generation postdoc. And she put together this slide to help illustrate the differences between um, how COVID has unfolded in Atlantic Canada and the territories uh, versus 
the rest of Canada. So on the left, you have cases per 10,000 people in the population. Starting from um, the beginning of the pandemic through to uh, May 31st, 2021. And some of the lines that are low down, these would be things like Newfoundland and Labrador, um, kind of having a little bit of an outbreak of the alpha variant in February, but mostly just sticking down on not really having many cases at all. So we tried to, to visualize that on the right hand side. And so this is uh, every week for the graph on the left. So cases per 10,000 population for every week that's showing over here and then a frequency distribution. Um, so what you can notice is for the Atlantic provinces, you've got a high frequency of weeks that are with very low cases per 10,000 population. And, you know, not really much tail on that distribution at all. So all of these graphs have the same X axis. So if you compare the Atlantic provinces um, to say the prairie provinces for the lowest bin, you've got about half the frequency and you've got um, these other weeks where uh, you've got higher uh, number of COVID cases. So this has been a feature of Atlantic Canada um, through this time period that we're considering through to May 31st, 2021, that there's been a low number of COVID cases. This is a graph of looking at community cases versus travel related cases. This is from the uh, COVID-19 Open Data Working Group. So this is trying to visualize just how many of the, it, um, from the previous graph, we know that there's been few COVID cases in Atlantic Canada and the territories, but now we wanna understand the distinction between community cases and travel related cases using this open data source. So the black line there is delineating travel related cases. So if you, again, look at panel A, Newfoundland and Labrador, you've got most of the, um, most of the cases being travel related, but then there was this really big outbreak of, well, really big outbreak of alpha variant in, in February. And so you can see the lighter shaded community cases above the black line there. Um, so, you know, different kind of picture for when we're doing this as a time series for different provinces, Nova Scotia having a little bit of an outbreak uh, in late 2020. Prince Edward Island really just only showing travel related cases. New Brunswick having some periods where there's community cases throughout this time series. And so what um, some other things that I'm interested in are um, just to illustrate how different the outbreak has been in Atlantic Canada for this uh, sort of first half of the pandemic, looking at of the cases that are reported each day, what percentage are travel related? So the median values here, so now I'm looking at panel G, for PI uh, and Newfoundland are actually 100%. The median is 100%. Every day we're, through that time period, just been reporting only travel related cases. Of course, there's some variation, particularly for Newfoundland, and sometimes it's zero that we're having a community outbreak and all the cases being reported are community cases. And then uh, Nova Scotia with a, a little bit of a lower median, New Brunswick with a lower median, and then in the Yukon Territory and Northwest Territories, um, they're seeing, I think, uh, kind of really different types of outbreaks and that there's just been so few cases reported that they're a bit different to examine than um, looking at Atlantic Canada. And so in panel H, I start to look at um, both the percentage of cases that are travel related and the total number of travel related cases. So here, this is panel H. In the upper right corner, you have Newfoundland and Labrador and Nova Scotia. These are provinces that have a high number of travel related cases, but are also a high percentage of those relative to the total cases. Uh, PEI 
having seen mostly only travel related cases, but about half the importations of Newfoundland and Labrador and Nova Scotia, uh, New Brunswick with high numbers of travel related cases, but a lower medium percentage of those being travel related. And then right in the bottom left hand corner, the territories which have seen relatively few travel related cases and uh, you know, maybe are experiencing, uh, maybe, maybe they need to be considered separately from Atlantic Canada. So that has been, uh, you know, I've been trying to model for Newfoundland and Labrador, and this has been what COVID has been like for us. It's been mostly importations up until relatively recently, apart from a couple of outbreaks, uh, the initial one in March, 2020, and this other one in February, 2021. So in order to model COVID in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's been, it's been a question of modeling importations. And so I wanna now talk a little bit about the framework that we've been working on to model importations for Newfoundland and Labrador. So again, this is the data source for the COVID-19 open data working group. For Newfoundland and Labrador, you see both open circles and solid circles. So the open circles are a, a data source provided by the Newfoundland and Labrador Center for Health Information. And the solid circles are the COVID open data working group data. And uh, there's a line there. It is based on the number of active cases per 100,000 people in the other provinces of Canada but it's a, it's a model selection approach. So we, we do model selection to try and find which other provinces of Canada are predictive for travel related cases to Newfoundland and Labrador. This model fit, it's Ontario, Nova Scotia and Alberta that are the provinces that give a parsimonious uh, prediction for travel related cases. And uh, the fit there for, so, so this is a statistical model and it has a pretty good fit for Newfoundland and Labrador. Use the same approach for um, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick, although for the other provinces in Atlantic Canada, just trying to predict travel-related cases from the number of active cases per 100,000 people in the other provinces of Canada is, uh, is it's less effective. There's uh, quite a bit of variation between the actual number of travel related cases and those predicted just by using that simple statistical model. So I'm calling this uh, estimating NJKT here um, because what I wanna do is kind of put this into a stochastic framework for estimating spillovers from travelers to the community. And um, that's going to be considering, for example, a binomial distribution. And in that binomial distribution, you'll have n number of trials and p probability of infecting a community member. And so this component, the number of infected travelers that are entering on any given day, is n in your binomial distribution. It's the number of trials, so the number of infected travelers. And for each of those travelers, is, there's some probability P that they infect a community member. So this is also just, so I, so I use this for forecasting a little bit. I wanna forecast the spillover probability where the spillover probability is the probability that a traveler infects a community member. And so uh, this approach is actually done by my collaborator, JC Laredo Osti. Uh, for, so this is forecasting two weeks into the future, how many travel related cases would we expect in Newfoundland and Labrador? And as I said before, this is based on the number of active cases per 10,000 people in Alberta, Ontario and Nova Scotia. And that just gives you sort of the, at, this is a graph that I made a while ago. So this is the past, not the future, but at the time the graph was made, this was the future. And it's just predicting like one travel related case per day. So as I said before, I'm interested in calculating what I'm calling the expected number of spillovers per week, where this would be infections from travelers to members of the Newfoundland and Labrador community. And so, um, 
like you could do this as, uh, you know, if you wanted to consider super spreaders, you could do say a negative binomial distribution, um, but just not doing that for a second. I, I sort of the easiest thing to do is to consider spillovers as coming from a binomial distribution. As I said before, I kind of know the, the number of travelers from my importation modeling. And what I want to talk about in the next few slides is what's the probability that the traveler generates uh, generates a spillover, and that's going to be to do with vaccination rates and local community measures. So we're summing across uh, J and K, and J and K are uh, vaccination statuses, and K is variance. So for every traveler who comes in, that traveler has a particular vaccination status, yeah, or, or like I'm predicting the number of travelers who come in, but then I'm interested in what's the number that are gonna be infected with a particular variant K and what's the number who have a particular vaccination status J because their vaccination status will affect what types of restrictions get applied to them by the Newfoundland and Labrador government. So I have to sum across all those different possibilities. And uh, so let's just take a look at P was the, P is the probability that uh, any traveler generates a spillover. And it depends on I, I is kind of an index for the time. So at different points in time, the Newfoundland government reopened. And so that's indexing the types of measures that are applied to travelers. And then J and K vaccination status variant. And we consider other, other things going into J, such as the uh, average number of close contacts that get infected for a particular jurisdiction. Um, this is from the regression that I showed previously. So J, the weekly number of travelers that are um, answering. T, the frequency of travelers with a particular vaccination status. So M is the spillover probability given no community vaccination. And then we have the frequency of uh, community members with particular vaccination statuses and the vaccine efficacy. And so this approach does, does consider local vaccination as a factor that affects the spillover probability. So again, this is a graph that uh, is made kind of before, not today. And so it ends before the Omicron variant establishes, but this is just um, working with um, actually Sanjeev, who I think is here, provided me with the variant frequencies that underlie this graph. And it's, it's looking at what expected percentage of travelers are arriving with a given vaccination status and a, and a given variant. Um, so you start off and it's, it's all original variants and it's all unvaccinated people. And uh, then we have the alpha variant show up and uh, it's mostly in unvaccinated travelers because people are not really vaccinated at that point. Um, you start seeing that the, the green dash line here would be alpha variant and partially vaccinated travelers because this is when they were becoming a higher prevalence in Canada of partially vaccinated people. And uh, you know, by the time we get to the end of December, it's all Delta variant. And uh, given that a traveler's infected, it's most likely that they're unvaccinated. Second, most likely that they're fully vaccinated because we're waiting by the percentage. All right, so uh, I, I'm interested in what's the probability of a spillover event happening from a traveler to the community, which is sort of hard to estimate. Uh, except that we have a little bit of information on this in that um, while there was 14 day self-isolation in place, all of the Newfoundland and Labrador community was unvaccinated. During that time, we had one outbreak of the alpha variant. So from the modeling that I have described here, I, I estimated that there would have been 316 travel related cases that were all of the alpha variants. And so um, I'm estimating that the probability of a spillover for alpha variant was one over 316. 
under these conditions where restrictions were 14 day self-isolation and the Newfoundland and Labrador community was fully vaccinated. Um, and then using kind of known, known results like that original variant is, uh, or alpha variant is 50% more transmissible than original variant. Delta variant is another 50% more transmissible. I can figure out for these other variants, if they were also undergoing 14 day self-isolation for travelers and the community was 100% unvaccinated, I can get a sense for how much more likely a spillover would have been or less likely if it hadn't been all the variants that were involved. So I use that piece of information and try to um, use it to, to figure out what are some other values for the, this PIJ, because I over time, Newfoundland and Labrador is gonna change its rules. So one example is that there's eight day self-isolation and uh, a negative PCR test required for travelers to, to exit self-isolation. So the way that I, I handled that is to, um, so this is the generation time. And I think this is for the original variant. So if you do eight day self-isolation, I take the integral of this curve up to eight days and uh, figure out the area under that curve. So that gives you an estimate of what's the probability that an infected traveler is released into the community if they undergo eight day self-isolation and if they were on day zero of their infection when they enter the province. You can apply the same logic if they enter, say, on day five and they self isolate for eight, eight days. Well, there isn't really any infectivity left there. So, um, kind of comparing to 14 day self isolation and using this curve and assuming a uniform distribution of days since exposure for arriving travelers, it can kind of get a sense for how different periods of self isolation might affect the probability that people are infected and enter the community. Um, for effectiveness of PCR tests, I use this graph, which is showing the probability of flagging someone as positive when they're really infected. And so I can kind of get at that. And uh, in terms of Putting in the effect of the Newfoundland community, I look at the number of people with the different vaccination statuses and the known vaccine efficacies as another layer for um, calculating this P, J, I, K. So this is just a table of what it looks like. It kind of gets a bit complicated with all the different variants that you can have for K and just all, these are all the different reopening steps that Newfoundland and Labrador has had when they've changed restrictions on travelers. And uh, these, are, these are some of the values that I get here. So I've been doing the spillover modeling for a while. As I mentioned, uh, it seemed like the most important modeling to do for Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and every day this graph would get made and it would just say one travel related case, one travel related case every day. I was starting to wonder if the graph was broken. Um, <laughs> But then the Omicron variant came and um, when the other provinces were within their PCR travel, um, PCR testing, we're finding more and more cases of the Omicron variant. And, um, you know, a few days in, I opened up the graph and all of a sudden it, it um, yeah, it went from horizontal to vertical with the Omicron variant appearing in Ontario, Alberta and Nova Scotia. So this is the graph of projected N, number of infected travelers arriving per, per day um, from that statistical model. And uh, this on the right-hand side, I'm applying the P component of this. So Newfoundland and Labrador did put in new measures for uh, arriving travelers in response to the Omicron variant. So, I'll discuss those on the green graph, but up here on the pink graph, this is just if um, there was no change to the measures from step 2A, which was where we were for reopening. And so you can just see like with the um, increased prevalence, so the increased uh, the, the N, the number of travel related cases that were arriving, 
but also the reduced vaccine efficacy that the spillover probability went from, um, I guess you can read it better down here, sort of below one expected spillovers per week, uh, just absolutely shot up as a combination of the reduced vaccine efficacy and the infections and in regions that were gonna be importations to Newfoundland and Labrador. So um, the measures that Newfoundland and Labrador ended up bringing in were initially every traveler had to have five negative rapid antigen tests every day. Um, they would take a rapid antigen test every day for five days after their arrival. I think maybe that was in place for about one week before it was changed to Andrew had to self-isolate. And this is, this is what the graph looks like, the green, the green graph, um, if you put those measures in place. And uh, so the pink graph, I mean, you can barely even read it. It is, um, you can't really see what's going on at any point in time because it just gets dwarfed out by the effect of Omicron. Um, the pink hump there and the green hump, I mean, they're the same, they're the same height. Um, the only differences are these measures towards the end. And so with those travel restrictions, the um, with the rapid antigen tests and the self-isolation, the, the Omicron risk is being brought down to um, more commensurate with what has been the historical risk for spillovers in the Newfoundland and Labrador community. There's a little bit of validation going on in this graph. So in the dark gray, that's when community outbreaks have actually occurred. So the, uh, the alpha variant outbreak in February is there when there was quite low risk of a spillover, but you know it had one out of 316 chance of happening. So it was bound to, bound to happen somewhere. And uh, there was some Delta variant uh, spillovers uh, that was associated with uh, increasing prevalence of Delta variants in other provinces of Canada and also the increased infectiousness of Delta variants. There's another high period here, which is corresponding to, to an outbreak. So there's probably better ways to validate this, but there is some rough consistency with what actually happened versus what is the projected spillover risk. So this so far um, has been the framework that I've been working with for spillovers, but there's some, I think important future directions. And again, Dr. Zara Mohammadi for um, who's the mathematics for public health postdoc with myself and um, Monica Kojikaro. It has been working on improving the spillover modeling framework. And so uh, we, it's not very mechanistic. So it's very statistical in the way that I've been modeling the number of um, travel related cases that are expected to arrive. This can become more mechanistic if we know things about the travel volume into a destination province such as Newfoundland and Labrador. So this is from the IATA flight data. It's the year before uh, the pandemic, but you can get a sense for what are the source population, what are the source, um, where are people who are traveling by air into Newfoundland and Labrador originating from? So in the top one, it's mostly North America where they're coming from. And then you can break down North America more into which are the provinces that are the ones that are um, uh, the ones that are most travelers are coming uh, from. So, you know, Alberta, Ontario, and Nova Scotia are showing up as important in addition to Quebec. On that's a little bit consistent with what we've done through the statistics. And then um, there's multiple data sources to come at, come at this from. So another uh, important data source could be to kind of consider distances between cities. And so, um, you know, in Ontario, you have a lot of, a lot of cities. So this is defined by the, um, the maps package for R. So it's cities from 2006 that have populations of over a thousand people. Um, but you've got lots of, you know, lots of small dots over here in Ontario, because you've got lots of things that are defined as a city being really close to each other. And so um, this is another source of information that might help us come up with a more mechanistic prediction of how many importations. And so we're working of trying to, trying to put that together. Other factors that might come into it are looking at seasonality in importations. And so the top graph is again, the IATA data. Um, again, these are made by um, Zara. And uh, you can, 
you can look at just seasonal patterns and in, in importations or seasonal patterns and travel volume, which could then affect the number of importations that you're seeing at different times. And um, the bottom graph is looking at the impact on tra travel volume. So uh, this is international tourists entering, um, entering Newfoundland. So the pandemic is happening right here, uh, 2003. And you can see the drop off of uh, travelers relative to before that. So just you know, trying to understand how things like uh, the pandemic are influencing travel volume from a more mechanistic perspective. And then um, on the right hand side is a graph from the Public Health Agency of Canada, which is looking at the effect of uh, pre arrival testing requirements that the federal government brought in on on January seventh, twenty twenty one. So, I mean, that prevents infected people from traveling, but it also, um, yeah, so there's two things. It reduces travel volume because the infected people don't travel, or maybe people don't want to travel because it's too hard to get a test to come. And this graph is kind of showing both of those effects. And so, again, another line of data to try and be more mechanistic about predicting importations. In terms of the P component of a spillover, there uh, are other approaches. I'd kind of described one by looking at the generation time and looking at PCR testing results. But another approach would be to try and take these p-values from other people's papers. So the, um, the one on the left is looking at the impact of lateral flow tests as being um, used for pre-testing, pre-arrival testing, uh, and that they return results more quickly and can be done prior to boarding versus PCR tests, which might be done say three days prior to boarding. So, you know, that's that's giving, giving you a sense of, for modeling um, importations, uh, how effective are different measures at preventing people as importations coming in. And on the right uh, is a paper that includes uh, Sayed Mogadas as, uh, as an author and looking at different duration of quarantines and testing on exit, testing on entry, or both testing on entry or exit. So this is, um, so, so, you know, there's no reason to think that this probably is really that different in Newfoundland and Labrador. So if I'm interested in knowing um, the P that corresponds to different combinations of testing and isolation durations, then uh, I could just try and um, take values from, from this paper and, and maybe compare their method with my method just to try and get a better sense for what that value might actually be. And then finally, um, so I think for the smaller jurisdictions where there has been such a high percentage of travel related cases a lot of the times, I don't really like to couple importations with community spread in a differential equation framework because it is dealing with continuous valued numbers of importations and there's a minute probability of spillover per unit time, which, which gets realized in the ordinary differential equation framework, um, but doesn't get realized in reality uh, as, so, so blue here would be um, the importations, the predicted importations, which I can get from an importation model. And I kind of don't like to do modeling where um, I'm, I'm looking at scenarios where there could have been a spillover in Newfoundland in July when I know that actually there wasn't. So I have kind of gone to this framework that implements more of a switch where I'm only modeling importations up to mid-August when we know that there was a community spillover. And then when there is a, a spillover, then I start modeling the community spread with an SLAIR type approach in combination with the importations. But I do like to keep these layers separate when I know there hasn't been a spillover event. Okay, and so for the second part of my talk, I wanted to mention travel restrictions. This became a hot topic because uh, very early in the pandemic, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, passed a special measures order, which 
said that if you wanted to enter Newfoundland and Labrador, you needed to be a resident or you need to have an exemption. And uh, this, this became the subject of a court ch challenge in Newfoundland and Labrador and uh, is, is something that we, we worked on. And these restrictions were in place till reopening, um, which mostly happened in July 1st, 2021. Dr. Fitzgerald explained that the reason for the travel restrictions was that there was a low prevalence of COVID within Newfoundland and Labrador, but a high risk of introduction due to the high prevalence outside of Newfoundland and Labrador. So this um, modeling was done as a branching process and it was implemented by Dr. JC Laredo Osti, who is my colleague at Memorial University and an expert in stochastic processes. And um, it's mostly a branching process, <laughs> except one of the features of it is that um, it does have infectivity depending on the number of days since infection. So that's the generation interval that I had showed from Ferretti, um, some slides previous. So uh, I probably could have done Gillespie algorithm, but probably wouldn't have been able to do it with this additional wrinkle of uh, infectivity uh, depending on the number of days since infection. And so it was helpful for JC to have done that modeling and, and done it in a really computationally efficient way. Um, the model is, is kind of Slayer uh, format. So you have importations and they can be either preclinical, which means the person doesn't currently have symptoms, but they're gonna eventually have symptoms or uh, importation could be of someone who is asymptomatic. You have uh, susceptible people in the Newfoundland and Labrador community. They have some rate of becoming infected either as a preclinical infection that will eventually end up in symptoms or as an asymptomatic infection and then individuals recover. So this was at the time of um, no vaccination and original variant. And this branching process will predict the number of clinical infections, which is a quantity that we could then compare to data. So I think probably everyone that has been doing a model kind of similar to that at its very core. And so we uh, calibrated the model to the data for Newfoundland and Labrador. And this is really early on in the pandemic 2020. So um, we're looking at different contact rates. So these are percentage reductions relative to pre-pandemic contact rates. Or sorry, they're not percentage reductions, they're the percentage of uh, pre-pandemic levels. So 80% means 80% pre-pandemic level. And that's the scenario that um, results in some uh, community escape and exponential growth. And then we do some, we know that whatever we say about how many cases could have happened with or without the travel restrictions will be sensitive to what we assume about contact rates within the local communities. So we're exploring a range of different contact rates there. So on the left, we have with the travel restrictions and on the right, we have uh, without the travel restrictions. So you're seeing more cases on the right because there's no travel restrictions. You're seeing more cases when the contact rate is higher. And uh, in terms of matching with data, so what actually happened is there was travel restrictions. And um, you can see that the contact rate scenarios that are consistent with that are, you know, 60% reduction in contacts relative to pre-pandemic or 50% or 40%. So on the left-hand side. So this was just to get a sense of is this model able to reproduce the past? Does it do a good job of describing inf infection dynamics for Newfoundland and Labrador? And then we looked at how many infections happened in the nine weeks following the introduction of the travel restrictions, both with and without travel restrictions. These cases are broken down into, um, is it an infection in a local person? Is it a travel related infection? And, uh, Prior means that on May 4th, there were the travel restrictions implemented 
So it could be that there was an infected community member prior to May 4th and they infected a, a, a community member after May 4th and that's what's meant by prior. So the main results for this are that the mean number of cases was reduced by 92% owing to the implementation of the travel restrictions. The model also assumes that the number of importations is reduced by 92%. And this is, yeah, I think probably something that is going to come out for models like this. The number of cases will be reduced by the same percentage that the importation rate is reduced by. That's the mean that I'm talking about. If you move into looking at um, large outbreaks or, or things other than the mean, so the, the variance or the 95% prediction interval, then without the travel restrictions, there are also this higher probability of very, very bad outcomes that can potentially overwhelm hospital capacity. And in terms of travel restrictions, it's useful to, to think about um, the impact of delays because they, they are just going to delay the inevitable. So we also estimated that the travel restrictions would delay establishment by on average six months, which is kind of substantial when you consider that the timeline to coming up with a vaccine was around a year. I uh, also started thinking about travel restrictions in the context of variants and just trying to come up with uh, a sensible decision tree for what should be conditions for implementing travel restrictions. And um, so where you see symbols here, these are variants that might have these types of properties. So um, it can evade vaccine derived immunity, has increased transmission rate. Um, it's able to reinfect people or has more disease severity. So this is a decision tree that you can use if you want it, if you're jurisdiction and you wanna know whether you wanna do travel restrictions or not. So first of all, does the new variant have characteristics that are concerning? If the answer is no, then you can have limited travel restrictions or you don't really, you don't really need them. I mean, maybe you just need travel restrictions to the extent that they don't impact uh, your ability to respond locally. Uh, if it does have potentially serious characteristics, is the presence of the variant sufficiently high outside the region to warrant restrictions? If it's not, then limited or no restrictions. If it is, then you wanna ask if the variant is established in the local jurisdiction. Um, if it's not established, then travel restrictions are warranted because there's a big difference. It's, it's a serious variant and there's a big difference in prevalence within your province versus outside. If it has established in the local jurisdiction, then you're going to have exponential growth unless you think that you can eradicate it. And if you're going to, if you're going to, um, if it's established and you don't think you can eliminate it, then eventually the community spread is going to become much more significant than importation spread. And so you go off to no, you don't want to have travel restrictions. So really, there's only a pretty narrow region where travel restrictions are going to be useful. Um, the necessary conditions are that there's a high prevalence outside the province and within the province, either you don't have it or you think that you can get rid of it. But without those conditions, it, um, it becomes harder to justify restrictions that are treating travelers different from local community members. The reason why we say limited travel restrictions on the right is that uh, you're still going to be dedicating some effort to detecting infection in the community. And so when I say limited travel restrictions, it just really means detecting, spending the same or, or you know, a relatively the same amount of effort as you would to detect community infections uh, as to detect uh, border infections. So for smaller jurisdictions are, are I think more likely to meet the, the criteria for travel restrictions. If you think about the severity of a, a variant, that can potentially have different meaning in a smaller jurisdiction. If you have a very low healthcare capacity, then um, what might not be severe for a place with a lot of healthcare capacity might be severe for that place with low, um, low capacity. Having a lower travel volume 
um, means that eradication or elimination might be more likely. And um, other geographic and social characteristics that might affect the importation rate or the ability to eliminate are likely realized in smaller jurisdictions. And so although the um, what you need to have met to implement travel restrictions is really quite narrow. Smaller jurisdictions require special consideration in that frequently they would meet those criterions. I think I'm gonna skip this part because I feel like I should leave some room for questions. So uh, to conclude, public health policy may be different in smaller jurisdictions. Travel restrictions are, I think, an aspect of public health policy that particularly may be different in smaller jurisdictions. And it goes a bit beyond that in that the, the best local non-pharmaceutical interventions or, or pharmaceutical intervention strategies may then uh, come as a consequence of how strict travel restrictions have uh, decided to be in place. And then um, lastly, I think we do need to be clearer about when travel restrictions should be implemented versus not. When Omicron first started becoming in the news, there was this comment that days matter. If you're gonna do travel restrictions, days matter. Um, and definitely for putting travel restrictions on, days matter. And, um, I think we need to be clearer too about when travel restrictions need to come off because many places, and I think I've heard uh, uh, Julian Arino talk about this too, many places might satisfy the conditions for putting travel restrictions on very early, um, but then quickly you get establishment and it can't be eliminated and it, it makes sense at that point to roll back travel restrictions, but um, usually this doesn't happen very quickly. I think as mathematical modelers, one thing that we can do is just be clearer about both the criteria to put on the travel restrictions and to pull off the travel restrictions so that, um, and just be clear that, you know, they were recommending that you put them on now, but we're not, this doesn't mean they should stay in place indefinitely, that they need to be constantly reevaluated to make sure that they are, are still serving their role because once exponential growth gets going in the community, um, you know, and, and prevalence is, is relatively equal inside and outside your borders, it becomes less need to, to treat travelers different than community members. So I'm gonna acknowledge a lot of people and um, just also what I said at the beginning, I also like to acknowledge many people in the Canadian math biology community that I've reached out to throughout the pandemic with help for my um, modeling. Um, so my close collaborators throughout the pandemic have been Proton Raman, JC Laredo Osti, and Maria Matignoni, um, working uh, quite closely with Sarah Mohammadi, who's um, working with Mathematics for Public Health, uh, Julian Arino, Joseph Baffey, Josh Reynolds, Francis Anoki, James Watmuth, Sanjeev Sahara, Monica Kushikara, Choi Day, and Lisa Canary. It's not a it's not a comprehensive list, but these are um, some of the people that I've been collaborating directly with. Also, thank you to the Newfoundland and Labrador Center for Health Information, who uh, facilitates data data access for me, but also put together the Predictive Analytics Group, which informs public health policy for Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, the Public Health Agency of Canada. I find their weekly meetings to be really informative. Um, Atlantic Association for Research in Mathematical Science, um, and CERC for funding through Discovery Grant, but also through the Emerging Infectious Disease Networks, and then the, the three Emerging Infectious Disease Networks that I'm part of, CanMod, Mathematics for Public Health, and the One Health Modeling Network. So thanks everyone, and I'm willing to take questions if anyone has them. Hi, right, well, thank you so much for that. That was great, Amy. Um, Unfortunately, Jan Hong's had to um, duck out, but um, Professor Sanjeev Sira, who you'll, many of you already know, has uh, kindly volunteered to step into the breach and just to chair the question and answers. So for those of you who don't know him, he's a professor at UNB, and he's also a member of Mathematics for Public Health. So I'm just going to hand over to Sanjeev now, and thank you. Th thanks very much, Sarah, and uh, hi, Amy. How's it going? Um, thanks for, very much for the great talk. Um, yeah, so we can just open up the floor to any questions if anybody has them. I think we're a small enough group that you could feel free to unmute and ask or uh, ask something in the chat.
I'll start it off, kick it, uh, kick it off a little bit, Amy. How are you finding the model validation working with, with this? Like, do you have enough data to test the assumptions about the, um, like the spillover rates and things? Yeah, I didn't, I don't think I really did it as well as I could have. Um, like I was saying, it's sort of just trying to match up that when I saw a peak and then predicted, I think what would have been better, um, I think I would like maybe like to look at the distribution of times between spillovers and compare that with the prediction. Um, are there other jurisdictions or are there more examples you can get just for like, I'm trying to think of other places that would be kind of like this. Yeah. Um, so something that um, was mentioned, and I don't know if anyone has a better sense of this, was that you can get line list data from Ontario, from Public Health Ontario, if you request it, and it will say whether a case is travel related. That's still, it's still pretty hard to know when a spillover event happens, because um, that's when a community member gets infected by a traveler. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how, so there are these like really great epidemiological studies where it's you've got nodes and it's like this person infects this person and that i mean that if it was resolved to that level like the individual level rather than sort of the math biology way is more population level and you lose those individual linkages but i mean i've seen really nice graphics like that coming out of china so um maybe if i look back through some of those publications it would it would kind of give some sense of what the spillover Ray could be. It's just hard because it's, it's also going to be sensitive to local characteristics as well. So even if I could estimate it from another place, then we'd need to think about what are the confounders and try to control for them to bring it back. But yeah, it is, it is like a graph that I make and it's like, take my word for it. I'm not really sure not really sure how to validate it. But um, in some ways, we're lucky in the in Newfoundland and Labrador, we had that situation where there was no COVID. And so when a spillover happens, like you, you notice, cause it's not on the background of a lot of, uh, a lot of infections. So. Yeah, it's so actually just, kind of luxury almost, but yeah. Following on from that question, because the population is smaller, is that maybe something you get funding for to do like a small cohort study to look at, you know, to do an an outbreak, if you don't have that data to do like an outbreak investigation. So go and look at, at where it could have been linked to. Cause that might, I think it might be easier to do in your population size, I think here it's it's too difficult, especially with something like Omicron that's so transmissible. But in a smaller population where people actually even know who they met, who aren't actually members of their household, you know, like I appreciate in a smaller community, you actually know people, even if they're not part of your household, like you know who they are and, and where it probably came from. But if you ask people, who do you think you got it from? They would probably know, even if it wasn't a member, like a, a close friend, they'd be like, oh yeah, I think I got it from so-and-so. Like, is that something that you can do? I know that's not, I come from a um, public health background. So, so we quite like to get into the, you know, into the weeds in these things, but I think it's, it's different with mathematical modeling where you're looking at more population data. Yeah, no, for sure. I think um, it's like, I'm really interested in these effects of population size. Cause you know, I, I don't know how much we've really got into how parameters might scale with population size and, in mathematical biology and there were a lot of delta there were some delta outbreaks in newfoundland but they they all were in small communities and they all went away uh, which is sort of you know it wasn't really what the feeling that i was getting from the larger jurisdictions that you could just introduce delta to the community and it would just go away um and one of the things that i was kind of thinking is you know everyone knows each other in these communities so if you're at the grocery store and someone asked you who was in the grocery store with you, like they could probably tell you the names of the people. And so contact tracing almost like gets done by itself. Uh, I think also a lot of work went into the contact tracing in the, in the smaller communities, but that kind of thing is not really something that we think about explicitly in the models all the time that with small at small population sizes, maybe there's like really big changes in parameter values and, trying to uh, trying to think about that more and in terms of the outbreak analysis I first wanted to do that with the alpha variant outbreak in Newfoundland and Labrador in February and it's just really hard with our public health capacity 
to get data. They're they're really busy, and uh, we got cyber attacked. And uh, I like I, I honestly feel like they do want to get the data to me. They were missing one variable that I needed, so I got data up till June, and then everything happened. And you know, the same people who are trying to get me the data are the same people who are trying to input the contact tracing data and. Uh, Obviously now they're completely overwhelmed because they have to input test results that are orders of magnitude higher than they've ever seen before. So I, I want to get to it, um, but I'll have probably is not not a good time to follow up with the data custodian and ask them if they can please provide the data. That's a kind of common theme. You kind of think public health is trying to hide something, but no, they're just really too busy to actually pay attention to you sometimes. But yeah. Um, hi, Jai Hong. You made it back. Um, so uh, some, some further questions for Amy? Maybe I can ask a question. Amy, I just feel your technology will be mostly desirable by, for China. Uh, even for that matter, so probably in New Zealand, those are very relatively isolated and uh, most cases are uh, imported and may trigger large outbreak. So uh, is, is that true that... Uh... Um, so so your, your question, so, so China, I mean, New Zealand, I can... So I think islands are another aspect to, so maybe your question is about the slides that I kind of skipped over. So, you know, there was, and it's a Baker paper, he's a, a New Zealander, and they talk about eradication, elim elimination, mitigation, and then I forget what the last one is, but it's sort of like, just don't do anything. Mm. And so there's all these different strategies that you might you might implement. And uh, so the, the eradication one was one that had been attempted by some of the Pacific Island nations like Fiji and Samoa, where um, not only do you not want any COVID in the community, you also don't want any travel related cases. And then elimination is kind of like the Newfoundland and Labrador one where you, you have travel related cases, but you eliminate in the community. And then um, suppression is where you, you let cases come in, but you need R0 less than one. And so you want to burn off those infection chains. Um, and then after that, you maybe want to manage to healthcare capacity or maybe you just want to let the thing go. So there's all these different strategies that you can do. Um, but I think the, and, and I, I don't think, sometimes I think the discussion has been cast in terms of the best strategy is eradication or the best strategy is elimination. But I actually, I think there's a whole bunch of conditions for when each of those strategies might be optimal. And the challenge is to figure out when each is optimal. I mean, even New Zealand, when Delta got into the community, um, they were like, all right, like we're, we're not gonna eliminate this. So we're, we're changing our strategy. Um, so that's, that's one, um, one thing that affects whether your strategy is suppression or elimination. Um, I mean, obviously the thing I haven't mentioned, but is a big feature of Newfoundland and Labrador is that it's mostly an island. And uh, then there's Labrador, which has a land border with Quebec. But in terms of policing the border, um, you know, keeping track of uh, people who come in, it's much more feasible to do that in New Zealand or Newfoundland and Labrador than, than Sanjeev is noting that in New Brunswick, where you know, you've got land borders with the United States, you've got land borders, and you probably don't have a lot of people coming into airports through from New Brunswick. So uh, just in terms of the efficacy of uh, catching importations at the border, Newfoundland and Labrador can do a great job because there's really not a lot of ways to enter. Um, in terms of how much money it would cost to achieve the same amount of catching cases at the border in other provinces, I mean, mm -hmm. again, I think you're kind of looking at a graph that has kind of this kind of shape. And, and, and so, yeah, there's uh, different geographic and social features that are going to go into which strategy is best. And I think one of the one of the messages that I want to say is that it's not going to be that the best thing that Newfoundland does is the best thing for Ontario. Um, and it's not even that what Newfoundland does early in the pandemic is the best thing for Newfoundland to do later in the pandemic. 
So there, yeah, this is a big, a big challenge. I think this is probably what everyone wants to figure out is when to do what and multivariate and no one person or even all of us are going to solve it uh, anytime. It's, it's going to be a, a big effort for a long time, I think. Cool, thanks. So I guess we've leaked a little bit over three o'clock there. So I was just wondering, maybe there's time for one quick question if someone's got a Got one from the audience there. I see a hand somewhere from Hudson Blue. Please go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, great. So uh, hi, everyone, and thanks, Amy. That was a really interesting presentation. I'm just curious um, if you thought about kind of applying this to, or if you've done this in the past, applying this to uh, rural and northern communities, because, I mean, you, you talk about how all this is useful for an island, but in many ways, um, you know, those communities have a lot of the same characteristics in the sense that's a very bottlenecked, you know, there's only so many ways in and out. And, you know, I just asked because that's kind of what we're, one thing we're really focusing on in the, the EOC team. I'm, I'm a grad student working for Dr. Asgari. So I'm just kind of, I'm curious if that's a, you see that as an application for, for kind of this work as well, or if it's just purely limited to, um, you know, what you specifically talked about in the, this project. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So I think there's the scale at which uh, decisions can be made. Uh, so with the special measures orders in place, and with health being a provincial jurisdiction, provinces can make different decisions, different decisions. Um, and so that's, that's a scale of decision making. Um, you know, for, to give a Newfoundland and Labrador example, is it, would it be beneficial to say that there are travel restrictions, there should be no travel travel between the island of Newfoundland and Labrador? In some ways, that's not really a question that is very easy to answer because practically uh, Labrador is not an independent decision-making place from Newfoundland uh, in terms of uh, like being able to make laws to restrict travel. So I think one, one aspect of this is uh, what's the scale that decisions can be made at um, legally. Maybe there can be recommendations. Maybe Labrador could recommend that no one from anywhere else enters, but that's one, one aspect. And another aspect is cutting off uh, from essential services. So I think provinces tend to be set up so that they have essential services. But if you try to... Um, cut at smaller levels. So say like Northern communities in Ontario, um, you know, you can put travel restrictions in, but I don't know if anyone would make them legal or more recommendations because are you potentially cutting off individuals from the ability to go grocery shopping, the ability to see their doctor? Um, so yeah, I, I think Certainly some of the ideas, uh, they, they apply, the ideas apply beyond um, islands and maybe flying communities are a good uh, parallel to, to islands. But it's, yeah, I, I probably have thought about these types of things with, with your work too. Um, but yeah, there's the tension between the epidemiology, epidemiology where it would be really good to, to segregate communities, uh, but then also the reality that a lot of the communities do need services coming in, trucks with food and that kind of thing, and uh, disrupting the flow of PPE or healthcare workers and, and that kind of thing. So probably you've thought about it more, more than I, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. That's it's interesting to think about too, because it, you know, the communities present a really interesting kind of cross section too, where they're small communities that are a part of a larger province, but then they also have a lot of decision making power on their own in terms of if they want to shut down their community, they can. So it's really interesting. But yeah, I, I appreciate that. And again, the your presentation was really interesting. Quite enjoyed it. So thank you. Thanks. Great. Well, if no one wants to sneak another one in there. Uh, well, let, let's thank Amy uh, once again uh, uh, for a great presentation. It was uh, uh, really awesome to listen to. And um, thank you all for attending. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Amy. And our recording will go up online so we can share it with a wider audience. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Nice to see everyone, too. I like your bicycle. <laughs>